Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we bring you up close and personal with some of Canada's most exciting and vibrant communities. My name is Chris Brown, and I'm your host for this exciting journey. Over the course of this series, we'll be sitting down with local elected leaders from communities all across Canada. We'll learn about who they are, what drives them, and how they are working to make their communities a better place for everyone who lives there. We believe here that the best way to understand a community is to talk to the people who live and work there. That is why we are honored to have today's guest. Please help me welcome to the show Mayor Cam Guthrie of the City of Guelph in the province of Ontario. Cam, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you so much. Very glad to be here. Appreciate so, it. So, Cam, I'm going to start with the question I've asked every single politician, so you're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve come from? Oh, um... <laughs> Well, the hard-hitting questions be, right off the bat. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. Uh, I, I would think it came from my my parents, and I would just say more, more specifically my dad. Uh, he he was always very vocal uh, in you know yelling at the television about politicians kind of stuff, and uh, want, but he was always giving back to the community, volunteerism. Uh, they my parents instilled in me that uh, that's just those values so uh so seeing it modeled seeing it taught sort of lent itself to want to always give back which we did as kids growing up uh, my sister and I and and others we were sort of surrounded around that philosophy of giving back making the commitment and time to do it uh and then it just it morphed into even me starting to look for opportunities for community things and then it you find out that community different different community things are somewhat always entangled with government, and so then it 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 started to kind of feed with me to say, oh, maybe there's an opportunity here for me to uh, give back on a more broader scale within the community, make a difference than like little tiny things all over, uh, but to go into into this type of a servant role. And and I I do I know you know it's the politiciany thing you know uh, I'm serving you know uh, but I actually really. I really, truly, that's the way I've always been taught. That's sort of been ingrained in me. I, I do feel like it definitely is a servant position. So, so you talked about your father yelling at the TV. For I want to go back to that statement for a second, because the one of the reasons why this show kind of started in this whole series about local elected leaders is because locally we forget that politicians are there unless your uh, garbage isn't picked up, your water tur isn't turned on. When looking back yeah. at your father, was he yelling at the municipal politicians or was he yelling at the provincial and federal politicians? And what made you say to yourself later on, you know what? Municipally is where it's at. Municipally is where I can give back more than I can give back provincially or federally. Uh, it was not municipal uh, <laughs> that I remember at all. Uh, more specifically, you know, back, you know, just to, from a time frame perspective, it was, um, I think it was the second term of Mulroney at the federal level. And I think there was in that, in that kind of area of the calendar, uh, there was Bob Ray with the NDP and, pr and from provincial uh, government. So uh, there was uh, some fairness of yelling at the TV at, at different levels of government from my dad. Um, and so, uh, yeah. And then to your second part of the question, which was, you know, then then if, if you see your parents, you know, yelling at the provincial or federal, <laughs> why are you in the municipal? Uh, I just felt like my, my first foray into politics was, uh, it, at the municipal level as a trying to run as a councillor because I just felt like at 30 years old or I, I was, um, it was easier. I guess just just going to say it outright. It was easier, but still I knew I could make a difference at the local level, but still be involved in, you know, quote unquote politics. And, uh, and I've just loved it ever since. Uh, yes, I'm asked all the time to run provincially and federally. Uh, there's people knocking all the time, but I consistently just keep loving what I do here at the local level because uh, I, I love being able to, I always joke with my wife, it takes an hour to get milk at the grocery store because uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm being stopped all the time in the, in the aisles about uh, 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 matters of municipal issues, but I can help with that kind of stuff or, or explain something or whatever. And, uh, and then I'm still home in five minutes. So I, I still act after that hour talk. So I, I, I love that uh, local vibe. 
So what happened in 2010? So you were elected in 2010 as counselor, if I'm not mistaken, if I've done my math here correctly. Was this yes. the first election yes. that you had contested? No, I, I ran the, the term before and I lost. So, so I 2006, ran the first 2007? Yeah, 2006. Yeah. Okay. And uh, and I, I lost that election. I was, it, was very, it was very close. I think I think it was like a couple hundred votes uh difference you know not bad for a first time out and i uh, i i will always remember you know you're upset obviously because you know you, you run to win uh but i remember like immediately saying like okay what can i learn from this and i think i still have the piece of paper at home somewhere in a file like i, I wrote like a like you know a line down the page i'm like what did i do right and, and what did i do wrong and then I had another quadrant where what did they do right? What did they do wrong? And I immediately did a, you know, a, a good gut level check about what I did and, and then worked hard for four years to continue to just to help in the community like I was anyways uh, looking. But I was pretty focused on saying I'm going to run again. And, and then I did and then I won. So I want to talk about that 26 election, 2006 election for a second, because I, I, I remember the first time I walked into a ballot box and I saw my name on the ballot and you get a little chill in your your spine saying, what have I gotten myself into? But at the same time, all the work that you've done up until that moment is now done. The moment you put that check mark or X beside your name and the ballot box closes, everything yeah. you've done, you've put on the table. What was that experience like for you walking in and seeing your name? And do you still get that same chill? Yeah, it feels very weird uh, putting a, a mark beside your own name. <laughs> you almost feel like just spoiling your ballot just so it doesn't feel so weird. Uh, but uh, yeah, you know, it, 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 there's a relief moment, actually. You know, OK, everything's done. It's 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 completely out of my hands now. It It's up to the voters and whatever happens, happens. And, and so then then there's that nervousness for, you know, five hours after that to find out what happens and what the results are but uh, it, it I, I always like it and it's always kind of neat standing in line with everybody else that's doing that you know playing out their democratic right to vote and people you know are, are nice in line to talk to like oh hey you're the guy running for council or, or you're the guy running for mayor right and, hey i'm voting for you or whatever. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't i haven't yet had somebody go like i'm not voting voting for you but uh it's been you know i i like it it's it's a it's a pretty pretty great moment you, all the work comes to that moment and so it's it's nice to nice to see it play out you don't get elected and then re-elected as mayor three times after that by not having a pulse on your community in the elections that you've ran are you shocked at some of the issues that come up at your door? Are there micro issues that you go, oh, I'm surprised someone's talking about this, but I'm happy someone is because then we can help address it as the city, if if reelected or elected. When you are out door knocking during your multiple campaigns, have there been more macro issues or micro issues that you've been confronted with, in your opinion? This particular third election being, being just last fall, um, for my third time as mayor, I would say the, the macro issue is just overall affordability uh, because it's coming from everywhere right now. And, and so I would say that was probably the biggest macro issue this time around. But at the end of the day, I would say the most common thread is the micro ones, which is, I, I call it, I've always called it this, the front porch issues. I've always called it that. And so what are the front porch issues? Well. It's the, it's the crack in the sidewalk that's been there for seven years. And why isn't it fixed? It's the plows plowing the road uh, when the snow comes. Um, it's why, are, why, aren't the, why aren't the baseball diamonds uh, cut uh, for the, base, the little league baseball game that's about to happen? It's, it's, these, it, it's where municipal government sort of smacks people in the face on a daily basis. And... Uh, so I, those are the common micro issues that I, I tended to have had being a counselor and, 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 and mayor. But this time around, affordability was that sort of, and housing and housing, affordability and housing would be the sort of the two macro uh, issues, I think, that really played out. I wanna... and, and I would say, too, I would say that, that those two issues played out quite a bit 
also because I think it was being amplified by the provincial government, those two things, and by the federal government too. So it was kind of like everywhere. So it wasn't a surprise to hear those issues on, at the door. I, w- I want to talk about uh, the, the the role of council in addressing some of those issues because affordability is a big issue that I'm hearing a lot from not just yourself but across this great country of ours, and I and I hear it over and over again. And as mayor and council, you have to present a budget that is going to affect people's pocketbooks, and you're going to be a, a contributing to that affordability issue for some people. How do you do that? Because I can imagine it must keep some people up at night thinking, okay, I have to make sure I'm doing this the best, but I also need to understand that if we don't grow and we don't add services, our city is not going to be what people want it to be. How do you do that in today's age of hyperbolic partisanship? So I think it just comes down to truth telling. And (laughs) so like, I'll, I'll give you an example. When I first ran for mayor, you know, I ran on wanting to, you know, keep budgets at the rate of inflation or less. That was kind of one of my platform things. And so when I brought that issue after being elected to council, um, it actually it, it, it got voted down by council. So I wasn't able to implement it. Uh, but um, it shifted the thinking, not only amongst councillors, but it, it, it shifted to more around instead of a number, it's about value. So what value are you bringing to the public uh, through your budgets? And I will re- always remember during that first couple of years, really finding out just how bad uh, infrastructure funding was in the city and how it had been neglected for so long that there was a, a major issue. And so here, here, here's me, the, the guy who ran for mayor and said, I'm going to uh, try to limit your taxes to the rate of inflation or less. And a tax levy was introduced specifically for infrastructure. And I voted for it because I had to be a truth teller and just tell the community straight up, this, this is how bad the problem is if we don't if we don't fund it properly, if we don't attack this issue now, it is it is not going to be uh, a good. It's not going to be good for future generations. So I think um, that's where budgets have shifted a little bit for me. It's about being really truthful about what we're facing. It's really explaining that from a communications perspective and engagement with the community, so they understand it a bit better. And um and you know, I've been reelected two more times since then uh, because I just tell people I just tell people straight up what's going on. And uh, I think that's where, uh, you know, budgets have to kind of move to. It, it can't be about an artif- an artificial number. It has to be about what what is the value being brought out of a budget uh, while still maintaining a, a lens of affordability, of course. Uh, but uh you know, I'm not going to say no to a budget because it's 0.2% of a number difference and then you get nothing of value. Uh, no, I'm going to vote for something that might be a little bit more or a little bit less here and there because it will bring that value. How much does truth and respect play in your day-to-day life as mayor of a community like Guelph? Because I can imagine being truthful and being upfront with your residents is one thing, but being respectful to them and saying, this is why it has to be this way. And I I understand your concerns, but at the end of the day, if we don't do it this way, it's going to make the city worse off. How much, how much responsibility does truth and uh, respect come into play for you? Well, so I, I, I just think that authenticity, so being authentic is actually one of the reasons why I ran. I personally was sick and tired of sort of scripted politicians that never answered questions ever and uh, always deflected or spin. And I, I came in saying no more of that. I'm just going to tell people straight up what's going on. And so I think, I think I have sort of some credibility around being authentic with people and being real. 
And, uh, and, and so I, I think I've grown sort of a base of people saying, well, you know, I may disagree with what the guy is saying, but he is at least laying it all out factually. This is the truth of the matter. This is what the city is facing. Uh, and I, you know, I think I've done a pretty good job about that. And I will continue to do that because I, I really don't like it when, when people don't answer questions and, and, and spin. So it, you would not make not it as a provincial bad. or federal politician then, because that's what they're kings of. <laughs> <laughs> well, I won't comment on that. But, <laughs> I'm joking. It, it, uh, it uh, you know, it, I, I think people respect people more when you are even on the opposite side of them, but at least you just tell them. I agree. I want to, I want to go back to a question that you talked about a little bit early, a statement that you said a little bit earlier about going to that grocery store and taking two hours to go get milk. Sometimes <laughs> you've been in politics since, since 2010, you've been elected since 2010. Have you found the private life, public life, balance tricky because i think there's a lot of people who don't get involved in municipal politics because they remember that i'm the mayor or counselor 24 7 while it's a part-time job part-time pay you are there 24 7 in your community you're not in ottawa you're not in toronto you are in your community have you found that balance and if not or if so how did you do it so i would say being I'm going to talk about being mayor, not count when I was a counselor. So, you know, I'm in my ninth year as mayor now, and I would say I probably only found my real groove when it comes to work-life balance, uh, plus the ability to be a bit more assertive when I'm saying no to things, maybe in the last couple of years. Is it hard to say no? Is it hard to say no to people? Very, very hard to say no. Uh, I found when, especially when I was first elected, uh, because it's natural, right? You get, it's, it's like a job interview, right? You get hired. So you want to prove to your bosses, plural, the citizens, that uh, they made a good choice. So you say yes to absolutely everything, which, and by the way, I love the events. I go, I go on average, I think I do 265 events a year. So I'm still completely busy uh and i love it but uh there in the last year and a half or so i have i have found my groove a little bit to sort of start to say i'm going to delegate this off to you know the mayor of the month uh, to, to take my spot or uh because this event i'm going to is an annual and reoccurring event i'm going to say no this year but i'm going to go to the next three um because my family is is very busy as well and i just i feel like i'm gonna there's some things i don't want to miss out on in my kids life and you know making sure my marriage is good and so i um i i've learned how to say no a little bit more and i i think uh i don't mind saying that out loud you know i think i think covid was actually very hard on me as well um from a, a leadership perspective to to wade through covid over the last uh few years with that with the height of covid and uh and so i i needed to um i needed a little bit more well-being time for me and part of being well-being is be the ability to say no do you still enjoy though going to the grocery store and getting stopped for those two hour conversations from time to time i can imagine because you yeah. seem like a personal yeah. guy I, I follow you on twitter and i know that you are the probably one of the most active city uh, mayors that i've ever seen asking <laughs> twitter polls at nine o'clock at night or 11 o'clock your time and i'm going well, yeah. this guy seems to be engaged you seem to like that you seem to thrive on the engagement aspect of the job I do. But you know what? Answering this question based on a little bit on your last question, you know, I, I use my social media very purposefully in three different ways. So Twitter is very conversational, very yeah. engagement back and forth, informational as well. Um, Instagram, 95 percent of my Instagram is just to make people laugh. <laughs> I, and, and so everyone else just chill. It's not a big deal. It's just I, I do a little bit of informing. But other than that, it's just to make people laugh. On Facebook, I give information and then I run away uh, because it's toxic. So I purposely use uh, my social media in, in different ways. 
And, uh, but I've only started to do it very purposely like that in the last year or two. Um, and so I think my well being has actually become a lot better uh, for not being sucked into, especially Facebook. Facebook was just awful. Uh, uh, so uh, I still make sure I'm engaging, I still make sure I'm informing, but, uh, you know, I am running a city, quote unquote. Uh, and I, I, I mean, I, I am full time. I'm more than full time. I'm always on. I have a family. I have my own health to c- concern about. And there is that overall balance. But I do love obviously engaging with people wherever I go. Uh, it just can be a lot nicer in person. It certainly can. I want to turn gears here for a second. And I want to uh, go into the city of Guelph as a, as a whole. And before I ask the first question here, I want to preface it by saying this is a conversation between the mayor and I. This is his opinion. This is not a direction of council. This is not a motion of council. Seem to get a lot of emails on this question. Um, okay. Mayor Guthrie, in your opinion, what is the biggest issue facing the city of Guelph today? Growth. So we're one of the fastest cities in Canada, let alone Ontario. The province of Ontario, by law, is requiring us to jump from 145,000 people to 208,000 people within 30 years. And so to meet those those population targets, uh, it touches on absolutely everything. And so... You know, yes, you know, myself and council, we might vote on things every now and then that are for the moment, but often we're voting for things that are 10, 20, 30 years out because we're thinking about how we're going to accommodate for that growth. And growth touches on transit and it touches on amenities and it touches on infrastructure, safety, uh, emergency services. uh, I could go on. Parks. So it, um, it's probably the biggest, uh, the biggest issue is just growth uh, and having to accommodate for that. And with growth comes a lot of change and a lot of people, why, why, is, why is this four-story building uh, g- getting infilled into my, my neighborhood that I, I've been here 30 years and why is this changing and why are there why are there bike lanes on this road now? And why is all this infrastructure getting ripped up all the time to increase the pipe capacity? Growth, growth, all you, growth. You bring up a good uh, question and I wasn't going to ask it, but you kind of you alluded to it. So I want to jump in here. How do you do that? How do you grow a city while doing it sustainably for the people who are saying, not in my backyard? I don't want that four story apartment building in my area. I don't want my roads ripped up every 12 days to grow pipes. I'm saying 12 days hypothetically. Like I know it's like every three years or four years. How do you do that as council? And have you found that sweet spot to say, okay, we need to grow? The province is requiring us to grow, but we have to do it in a way that makes people feel okay with it because then i and i say okay people because i know there is a minority of people who are against growth and there's the nimbyism crowd but you as mayor have to still uh deal with them on a day-to-day basis so one of the things i think we do well although i would say we could do better on is uh upfront engagement in fact when i talk to other mayors that sometimes deal with these issues i'm saying well how much engagement did you do before a decision was made? How much engagement did you do before that road was ripped up or before that infill four-story building or five-story building was being done? And if if municipalities do the, the, the legwork of doing upfront engagement, and that shouldn't fully rest on just the corporate side of a city, uh, it should rest on the elected officials too, to be informing and engaging prior to votes on issues it t- seems to make people at least understand a lot more prior to when it's actioned, uh, whatever that issue is. And so um, I, I find that, uh, you know, no one really has their head buried in the sand here about like, oh, there's a housing problem. I had no idea, you know, so uh, everyone understands that it's now understanding, well, how do we fix it? Well, that does mean infill. That does mean higher, uh, you know, higher heights. Um it, 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 
you know, it, 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 I could go on and on, but it, it, I think engagement is, up front are, are residents up front engaged is, in your community are residents. Engaged? Oh yeah. Yeah. Like do they, because as yeah, someone who's worked are. in the communication sector in municipalities, I know that you usually hear from the, the majority of people after the fact that something's passed, whether you can, yeah. you can do as yeah. much engagement as possible. You can run it on radio, television, newspaper, door knock. You can do whatever you want, but there's always that group of people who will say, I didn't hear about it. I don't know what you're talking about. This is all news to me. So how do you engage people in this yeah. be a blanket approach of just trying to make sure you approach everyone, but understanding that you're not going to please everyone with every decision. Yeah, so that's why I said originally uh, the last answer. I started by saying, you know, we do a good job of engagement, but we could always be doing better. So I, I think there's ways of uh, leveraging technology, social media, as an example. Uh, our, our engagement team here is starting to get outside of city hall. For instance, we had uh, like a zoning. I think it was a zoning uh, engagement where they actually set up at like the local Home Depot. Uh, they set up at places where people would never think a municipal engagement uh, staffing would be uh, to interact with people. Uh, so they're, they're really doing some innovative stuff here to make sure that the messaging is going out in a, in a much different way so that we're you know casting the net wide and kind of getting as much people involved as possible. I will say that, yes, there are those that still at the end of the day after a decision is made say, oh, I had no idea about it. Well, then, you know what? I usually take you know, uh, the links of every single engagement opportunity over the last four years. And I send it to those people and I go like, what, this is what we did for four years. You, you, like, there was seven articles about this issue in the local media. There was open houses, there was surveys, there was council meetings. I, I'm sorry you missed it, but there was 42 opportunities for you to be able to interact with those things. Uh, and, uh, you know, is there and then is there a way we can interact with you in the next time? But I, I, you know, the decision's made on whatever the issue is, and we're moving forward. You, you talked about the front port, porch issues that you heard about during campaigns. As a city mayor, you are there to move the city forward. Like you said, you have to look at the city 30, 10, 15, 20 years down the line. But you also can't forget about those front port issues because those are the most important issues to the people of yeah. your community. How do you balance those front porch issues against the growth? Because if I go talk to 100 people in Guelph today, I ask them that same question. They're going to tell me more of these front porch issues than the yeah. more macro issues. So how do you as mayor balance those? Because during budgets, you only have a certain amount of money you can spend. And sometimes some of the issues that are important to your residents aren't going to be addressed this year, maybe next year, maybe the year after. But when it's important to them, it's very important. Yeah, no, I for sure. So I, um, I, I look at it this way. I, I usually direct people to what's called our corporate asset management plan, which is sort of the, the everyday workings of fixing the everyday stuff, the front porch issues. And, um, and then, of course, tied with that is just the ongoing operational side of things on those front porch issues. And we spend uh, way more time and money and resources on those issues than we do on what I would call city building. City building is the nice new stuff for down the road, you know. And um, and so when people are able to see clearly and easily, might I add, uh, you know, the pie chart that says X amount of money is going to all the stuff that's every day, the front porch issues and operations. And only this portion is going to kind of the new stuff for down the road. Um, it's an easy way for me to say, like, your your tax dollars are going to the very issues that you that you are looking for. Um, and I would just say, too, that, uh, um, I, we, you know, we could probably do a better job, I would I would say, of, of, of highlighting some of those things so that people are more in the know. Uh, municipalities sometimes think that the everyday turn, you know, the, the, the cranks just of the wheels and the cogs of the machine are just going every day. We need to probably do a little bit better uh, in, in highlighting, hey, we just fixed that pipe in the road. You might not have known it, but here's a sign that says, we just, we just, your tax dollars in action on the everyday things, right? Um, and then lastly, I would say is we, we did here at the city of Guelph for the last few years now, we implemented um, KPIs, uh, key point indicators, accountability, and people can um, actually look up online, like how, 
how many kilometers of pot, you know, or, or roads were resurfaced? How many potholes were done? Uh, the, so it's moving the everyday issues into an easily accessible, accountable, transparent way of reporting those things. So people go, oh, I, I didn't know that they did that. And that's something new in the last few years that we've been doing. And it's been helping a lot when people ask the question that you just said, well, where's my money going? Well, you can point them exactly right to uh, the stuff that we've been doing. You, you talked about how it's hard to say no, but sometimes you do have to say no in big, those front porch issues, whether someone says, I want a new pool in my section of the city because I think the other pool is too small and you have to drive 10 minutes to go see it. When you're looking at some of those bigger front porch issues that some people may come to you, is it hard to navigate what people want when it comes to growth compared to what the city's vision of growth looks like? Because what you are elected to, uh, the what your vision is and what uh, someone else's vision, they're going to be two different things. Yeah, you know, at the end of the day, uh, there are lots of things and ideas that fly my way. And, um, you know, some of them deserve an opportunity to be looked at. Um, some of them, you know, right away, they can't. Uh, I think it's better to be up front with people and just say, like, there's just no way this is going to whatever the issue is, it's going to happen. Um, so, I, you know, we have a strategic plan that we uh, adhere to. And so the strategic plan really helps guide council in being able to say yes or no. Because if it doesn't fall into that strategic plan, then um, I'm sorry, it's going to have to wait. So, uh, you know, is there always room within a strategic plan to consider something new or maybe a grant opportunity comes from upper levels of government or what on an issue? Of course. But um, we cannot be all things to all people. We get elected to have an opinion and to have, um, well, we get elected to say yes or no. I mean, there's there's buttons on, on our desks when we vote that say yes and no. no there's not a maybe button. Uh, it's yes or no. So, uh you know, I think people know up front also during election time, you know, what type of a person are they electing? Someone that's going to try to say yes to everything and then affordability goes out of whack or someone that has some kind of financial control on other people's dollars. Uh, and, I, you know, that's how I roll anyways. So I want to turn to my last segment because I am cautious of time here and I know you are a busy mayor. Uh, I want to turn to tourism because I love tourism. I love talking about tourism. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I love exploring the communities and I've made a pledge. Anyone who comes on my show, I will be in your community in 2023. So I'm going to be in the city of Guelph right. later on this year. Hopefully we can sure. sit down, grab a coffee. If not, uh, hopefully we can sure. grab just chat for two seconds. But I want to know what are some of the hidden gems my listeners, my viewers can see in the city of Guelph that you need people to know about? Uh, well, <laughs> I think the first thing that uh, the first thing that pops out to me uh, is um so it's about timing. That's why I'm kind of going. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, so our trail system here is amazing. Uh, and so uh, we have tons of trails, both walkable and bikeable. Uh, I, I love it. I mean, some, maybe a little bit of bias on, on here, but I, I love it. Lots of people love it. Uh, but if you can come at a time to experience that sort of stuff where it intersects with like our downtown that's shut down for um, events or uh, an experience uh, like our patio program with all the spilled out patios during the, the good months. It is a, a great vibe within our downtown. Uh, and then on top of that, I'm going to just add one more intersection. If you come during a good time to experience trails and oh, by the way, there's patios and oh, by the way, there's events in the downtown like uh, outdoor concerts uh, for, for that, like you can really have a great time um, in, in our city. So it's a pretty easily explorable city. Uh, we're not huge geographically. And um, I guess lastly, we're kind of known for uh, John, uh, John uh, McRae, uh, the author of In Flanders Fields. Uh, that's our Guelph's son uh, is what we, uh, we call him. Uh, we have the John McRae Museum and, our, and our, our big museum is always wonderful to come and uh and check out we invented uh clothes hangers and uh, the jock straps too so that's a pretty cool thing for uh, guelph 
I never thought that would ever be uttered on my show, but here we there are you go. in 2023. There you go. Yep. What, what, what about yourself, though? <laughs> after a stressful day at council, after a long day of meetings, where do you go to decompress within the city? Is there a watering hole? And before you answer, you cannot say your house <laughs> because every mayor councillor wants to say, I go and I lock myself in my room or my basement or my office in my house. Where in the city do you go to decompress? Uh, I will answer that because I told you I don't like it when politicians don't answer it. So I'm, I'm going to answer it. <laughs> uh, I usually I usually get home and say to my wife, can we go for a drive? And we immediately bump, j- jump in the car and uh, we go and we sit in the McDonald's parking lot with a large fry. That is the most sweetest thing I've ever heard with from that answer. Um, I want to wrap the truth. I want to wrap with this (laughs) final answer. And this is the million dollar question that I've asked a lot of mayors and counselors. Mayor Guthrie, what makes the city of Guelph such a unique place to live, to work and to raise a family? Well, it it almost ties in with the the tourism question, right? Um, But I, I will say that we are this medium sized city that has big city amenities and uh but and geographically we are we are close to sort of other areas you want to you want to hit toronto take the go train you're there and you know it's an it's, or it's an hour away um you know you can hit london in an hour and a bit away there's kitchener like we're just geographically positioned so beautifully and um and i would just say that you know it's people people come here because they they want those sort of big city amenities with that small town feel. And even though we're growing, you, and your other question, what is the biggest problem? I said growth. Uh, it, it, it's still uh, it's still that place where people are saying hi to each other on the street. There's that the nod, the the eye contact, the hey, good morning, uh, those types of things. Like we are one of the top cities for uh, in Canada for volunteerism. For um, for giving back to to charities and, and and nonprofits, when you know when Syrian refugees needed to come here, we we rally together. Um, we just we're just a community that that always uh, I don't know we just, we have his DNA here. It's just there's something just special about the, and you're thinking oh he's the mayor he has to say this stuff no uh i'm saying it because i'm a guelphite and i would say it before i was the mayor and i hope to say it after i'm the mayor uh, it's just a special place it really it really truly is and uh yeah that's why a lot of people are moving here i can say from the two times that i visited the uh, city of guelph back in the days when i was working at queen's park i i, I always had a fun time in that community and it brings back some old memories of you talking about it so i'm looking forward to getting back into the uh, city of guelph later on but i want to take a moment and say thank you thank you cam for sitting yeah. down taking time out of your busy schedule to do this it's always a pleasure to sit down with local elected leaders and shine a light on some of the issues that they're facing so thank you Hi, right, thank you, Chris. All the best with your podcast and all the best to your listeners and uh, happy to connect with anybody uh, on social media uh, except Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, I want to remind everyone, put down social media for at least five minutes a day and go have a conversation with somebody. Helps our society, helps our democracy, and it helps us be a better people. So with that, this has been the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. We'll be back tomorrow with another great episode with another great elected leader. Until then, just keep talking.